Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, latest edition of the Royal Blue Podcast. I'm your host, um, Chris Beasley. I'm joined uh, remotely by uh, our Everton correspondent, uh, Joe Thomas. Uh, he's out on location uh, somewhere in the vicinity of Finch Farm. And uh, Gavin Buckland from Buckland Towers, uh, by the looks of things. But, um, yeah, no... no uh, no football as of yet, Joe. Um, we're still waiting for that one. And I know, obviously, you've been speaking, doing an interview which is under embargo. But are you able to shed any light on on, on the mood from Finch Farm and what from what you've seen so far this morning? Yeah, well, I've um, for people who, who who are watching this, or see me in the car. I'm I'm in the car park of a well-known uh, Costa chain. <laughs> you said, it? <laughs> said it there. I suppose I suppose to a well known coffee chain. I just said, <laughs> Oh, if they're listening, maybe they'll uh, they'll maybe they'll sponsor us or something. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, Costa in speak at the minute. I've been just left Finch Farm. Um, I've been I've had the fortune this morning of speaking to, to James Tarkovsky. Uh, the details of that conversation will be you know publicized in in, in Sunday morning's papers and and on the on the website then and there, but um. Yeah, we got Sean Dyche's press conference in a couple of hours. We're we're recording this on Friday morning, um, but yeah, I, I think the you know it, it doesn't. I, I don't I don't think I cross too many boundaries by by saying that I think the mood at, at Finch Farm as 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 is within the club in all elements of the club from the fan base up to the uh, the Royal Ivor building, I think is probably one of frustration at the outcome and the treatment by the Premier League and the Independent Commission and a a determination to to go football to get things back about on the pitch and to continue the positive trends that we've seen before this international break obviously everyone went into this international break eight points clear the relegation zone and come out of it fairly entrenched in it without having played a game which feels very Everton at the minute unfortunately but I think that when you look at the way things have gone over the course of the season things on the pitch are moving in the right direction and and I think there's a hope that that will continue and as a result of that, hopefully cancel out some of the points deficit as a result of this treatment whilst, you know, in the chambers and corridors of power, things like appeals get discussed in the hope of, of reducing this the, the, the sanction that's been given. Yeah. Gav, um, obviously the, the club um, spoke straight away um, after the announcement last Friday, but it's, it wasn't until this week that we heard from any of the players, Dominic Calvert-Lewin, was the first one to, to speak out. He, he claimed that the, the, the squad are, are unfazed by um, this sanction, although he says he sensed a lot of unity and togetherness. Um, that's to be, to be expected. But, I mean, how much do you think this um, decision will impact on the players and do you think it could actually have a, a positive effect? At this level, I'm disappointed Joe didn't say he's in a helicopter, <laughs> uh, you know. As some sort of black ops operation, you know, from the echo top of the echo mm. build and flown out yeah. to uh, to Finch Farm, you know, I'm, I'm really disappointed. Um, I don't know, Chris. I, yeah. I, it, it goes back to you know some of the all the the the, the I think the best way to describe this, you know, all the the intrigue and and the sort of off the field shenanigans earlier on in the year, isn't it, with the club? How, how much does that affect the players? You don't know. Yeah. I, I actually don't know. Players are motivated by different things, aren't they? Some players can shut it off. Some people, some players, it, it can it can motivate them. Some people, some players may be demotivated by the fact that I know that they've lost ten points. I I, I, I actually don't know. Um, mm-hmm. I know you can come out and say, "Oh, the feel, feel together and togetherness and stuff like that." Well, you should be like that anyway, shouldn't you? Um, yeah. As as a, as a as a squad, so I I reserve judgment on that. Really, I think the impact, as we've seen this week, is almost certainly more on the crowd, isn't it, yeah. than than the players. You know, come on, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Joe, and but then before that, of course, um, director of football Kevin Felwell, like I've said already, um, interim chief executive Colin Chong, he spoke straight away. But then Kevin Felwell was the first person from the football inside of the operations. Obviously, the director of football. Got a quote from him. He, he believe it will provide the additional fuel to what we believe is a wholly disproportionate um, ruling. Um, what did you think of uh, Mr. Felwell's um, comments? Yeah, well, I think yeah, I think what that's a pretty fair summary of yeah. of where things currently are. To be honest, I, I think that there are ways in which what has happened is is a unifying force that hopefully brings the club together, all elements of the club from. Yeah, you know, the players to you know to to the club itself to the fan base 
together and unify in a common cause. Uh, and, and I think that is largely the case. You, you know, I think the the nature of, of, of the of the case and what we've heard so far, obviously, on the one hand, it vindicates the concerns that many fans were raising back end of, of last season and earlier on in this year. But such is the, the punishment and the severity of the punishment and the, the comparison between that and other attempts for the Premier League to put its foot down somewhat comically when you now look at what Everton have, have, have received. Um, when there's been previous attempts to undermine the sporting integrity of the competition, you know it's it's clear that there's a a powerful sense of of of, of, unju- of injustice here that can be harnessed by the club, um, both on the pitch and, and in the stands. And I think that's what we'll see. I think that I can understand where Gav's coming from with the idea of that for all the for all the words that have said by key people and and players, and obviously you know I'm sure Sean Dyche will say similar this afternoon. It's probably not going to be until two or three, four weeks till we really see the impact of this because, you know, 10 points is still a lot of, 10, it's a lot of um, points. And for all the positives that we have seen recently, Evan is still a Fred Bear squad with a very difficult December ahead. Um, and, you know, in many ways, I think Manchester United are a perfect opposition to play on, on Sunday, but they are still a very talented side. And, you know, if... If if Everton were to have a setback and then go into January into December, the runner games pick up a few suspensions or, or or injuries and say don't get out of the trouble immediately, then then I think we'll see the real impact that it has on the squad and whether or not this punishment has been as a, a uniting force or whether it perhaps kind of undermines or highlights the fragility of the resilience that we've seen so far. But we'll mm. have to wait and you know see how that. Um, unfolds over the coming weeks i think for the time being the message will all be about you know determination so you know solidity everybody acting as one unity and and hopefully hopefully that will get everybody over the line into a you know, positive sense of momentum that will build over the coming weeks and in a couple of weeks time we could we can look back with everton already outside the relegation zone and and and, and look ahead to the rest of the season like we were doing two weeks ago yeah I mean, Gav, the the um, the reaction from within the club is is inevitable. Um, we know that you know there's a, there's a united feeling against that, but it's a it's a topic that the wider footballing world has has been discussing, and some major figures. I mean, there's actually been a lot of support, and we'll come on to that. But Roy yeah. Keane, who um, seems for one reason or another, I don't know if he if he's still scarred from that seven one defeat through. The Sunderland side there, uh, although I mean, he said a few things about Everton over the years. But on this, uh, perhaps quite typical of, of, of Mr. Keane, he says, um, it's time for Everton to, to hold their hands up and take their medicine, learn from their past mistakes. Um, I think of Mr. Keane's take on the situation, because um, it's, it's not, they don't have a un, universal support. I'd, I'd say that there is a, a majority of what I would, I would describe as um, um, fair minded people yeah. thinking. Seems a draconian response, but um, it, you know it's not across the board, is it? And and, and Keane thinks that well, uh, there's clarity there for the ten points now, and then Everton can only look forwards. Yeah, I mean, to, to be fair to Roy, in, in his book, he said he was quite complimentary about David Moyes' reaction after the seven-one. He said he he sort of said that Everton had played very well and Sunderland were but unlucky and stuff. So. Nice. Um, yeah, I, I, so he was okay about that. I'm just thinking about the the, the one nil in 2005. I think when Ferguson scored, I think he got a bit riled that night, didn't he? Uh, yeah, but I, mean, I think that there's an element of truth in that, isn't it? I mean, we're not, we've not. It's not as if we we got ten points deducted in March 2023 and would have been sort of six points off of safety. We, yeah. We've still got a lot of games to play in and in and around the the relegation zone, so it's not it's not. Terminal for our chances this season, and I, I sort of, I can understand that if you point. Mm-hmm. One thing where he is right is we need to learn from it. Yeah, that, that that's where he's right. And mm-hmm. as for the wider football world, yeah, I, I, I sort of get that as well. But uh, it's a bit danger there that we. I spoke, we spoke up a little bit on this on on Monday. I think is I, th- mm-hmm. I think we're com- conflating two issues here. The first issue is us as an individual club and how we've dealt with, you know, how we, tra- no, well, not met the rules in our case. And also the second, but there's another issue there about the wider football world and how fair it is and, you know, profits and sustainability and do clubs get big 
clubs get the you know the the big decisions and all that type of stuff. They're to, in in some respects they're two they're two completely different issues. I'll be there's a link between them, and I think people are just throwing that throwing Evans thing into the mix and saying it's unfair because football it's unfair on Evans because it's unfair on football the way it's, the way it's organised, and I'm, I'm not sure that's right. Um, that and we'll both know whether Evans have been seated fairly. I think until after the after the appeal. He was being heard, to be honest with you, and I, I wait, wait until then to see to see that. Um, when when you read the report, and I've read it quite a few times, is you can see why they reached the decision, and 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 actually that that's that's the issue for me. You can you can see it; it's there. Um, and and Keen is probably right in that case. Is if you do if you do read the finer detail of it, is there's an argument to say, well, listen. It, 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 we're, we're culpable in what's gone on, so we'll just live with it and move on. And and I can see why he says that. The wider thing is, I think, is part of a wider discussion about how football is organised, how the Premier League's organised. And Gary Neville spoke about that, didn't he? And I yes. think there's now the use in that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, com- coming on to that, Joe, I mean, you obviously did the comment piece on the back of that, and which um, I, I'll quote you here. You said that the size of the punishment that is the issue. And those seeking to challenge that have merit. Um, Gary Neville made a, a lot of points there. He said if he was an Evertonian, he'd be furious. Describes the Premier League as a defunct organisation, trust and faith completely gone. Talks about greed rather than corruption, used the phrase lawless. And then he also points out that there are four sets of rules for sustainability over the, the four different um, divisions. So, I mean, there's, there's so many um, points there that, uh, to be fair, um, Gary Neville... Um, um, it's, it's probably right to raise those issues. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot, a lot of the comment, including from the the professional world, has has has, has been based on lazy perceptions. Really, it's, it's amazing how many people in high profile or senior positions, um, in terms mm-hmm. of the platforms that they're on, start their answers to this by saying, "I haven't read the report" or, or this or that. <laughs> you just, yeah. you know, when when they're setting the narrative. Um, you know, for for fans outside the Everton bubble on things like this, it can be quite frustrating. Um, you know, even with you know, I was on Football Focus last last week, and, uh, and yeah. Ashley Williams, obviously ex Everton, was asked yeah. about. He started his response by saying that he hadn't read the report, and obviously, I you know, I appreciate that maybe you know this is niche and esoteric, and for obviously people like me, it's my job to kind of get get on top of this. But it is annoying how many people are commenting without a position, from not not from a position of knowledge. And I think a lot of assumptions are being made that are misframing the argument. For instance, I don't think Roy Keane's actually talking about Everton fans. I think he's probably talking about the club more specifically in, in, in his comments. Yeah. But I think a lot of people who are critical of Everton and Everton's fans and their appeals um, to this sanction are missing the point that the vast majority of Everton fans, as far as I'm aware, accept that Everton deserves some sort of punishment mm-hmm. and probably just des- and, and broke the rules. You know, there, there'd be no harsher, more vocal critics of the way in which his club has been run over the past few years than than the fan base um you know the issue is over the nature of the penalty and how it it, it it got to the extent that it did and i think that's what gary neville's talking about and you know i i i completely agree with him on that front you know i say this this is cases un- unprecedented because everton are the first team to be you know found to have breached profit and sustainability rules but like i mentioned earlier that there are there is precedent of the premier league attempting to protect itself when the integrity of the competition's been put into question, and when you look at Super League Six, which is obviously what Gary Neville uses as his term of reference, and the three and a half million pounds they essentially got fined for attempting to completely undermine the, the English the sporting merit of the English football pyramid, it's at that point that you can kind of see where I think that those who are questioning the punishment have have um, have merit in their in their in their concern. I think there's mm. kind of a yeah there there are several ironies within this report in this process and I think that one of them is the way in which I think the Premier League has probably sought to try and impress on everybody that it is a a functioning reasonable trusted regulator of it, of itself and really this process has probably showed that it isn't um, and I think there are a number of own goals within the report and, and one of them and, and I appreciate this is probably more from the independent commission than necessarily the the Premier League itself is you know, for all the depth and the detail and the rigour of which they go through the case against Everton within the 41 pages. And like Gav says, 
there is clearly a case against Everton and even Everton accept that now. The lack of information that they give about how they reach the sanction really undermines their the, their authority in handing it out because I think if there was you know three or four pages of saying all the considerations and this is why we think it's this serious and this is why we give it that, this is why we do that, then I think that it would be far harder to try and find holes in what they were saying right now because we'd have a framework to work from. The fact that we don't have that framework for the decision-making is what I think gives Everton strength in their appeal because it's very difficult to see how they reached it um, because their workings out isn't made clear. And then separately, obviously that's an independent commission thing, but from a Premier League perspective, the complete lack of a framework for something like this also undermines its um, ability to try and say that it's it's uh, you know it's a, a suitable regulator of this because to have a, a process such as this in place where the pen- the penalties can be as extreme as they are, but to not have a framework for any sanctioning, well, it obviously leads people out to, you know, it obviously leads, it gives people an opportunity such as Everton to say, you know, where has this come from? Uh, and, and, to, and to question it on that basis, you know, undermines their own integrity on that. And that's an irony that probably isn't lost on Everton at the moment. Yeah. I mean, Gav, you, you said already about Obti and, You've you've obviously read the report a couple of times. Joe's poured through it. We we we've all had to to look yeah. through it. But I think that that is a problem. That is such a impassioned issue, and people on both sides got such strong views about this. But then, like you say, a lot a lot of people haven't even um, b- b- even bothered looking at the details. Fair enough, you know. When in the twenty four hours afterwards, like maybe yeah. they haven't had to, but you know, we're we're almost a week on now. Yeah, I, I think there's been a lot of stuff out on social media about it as well. That's just not true. Yeah. And people have been using that against the Commission and the Premier League. And that doesn't, as I said, I think I said this on Thursday, that doesn't help. Um, I, mean, I think... Are you referring to the, the sporting, the sporting um, no sporting advantage claim? In that no, the, it, was, uh, it was a piece which I don't think was factually correct in one of the newspapers about the sequence right. of the, the, the incest payments and stuff on the stadium. And it and it, it gave it quoted bits from the commission that actually weren't in the commission, you know. And that doesn't that doesn't help, to be honest with you. I think and similarly, I think that, that yeah, there is running yeah. through a lot of the commentary yeah. on this and the frustration. I think there's an idea that the commission said Evan didn't gain a sport and advantage in that, and I'm, I'm not sure that that is actually their case. I think no, implicit, no, no. implicit throughout everything that the Premier League say. And the and the, the commission in their finance, I think it's it's quite clear that they believe Everton did gain a sporting advantage. Yeah, yeah. Quant- quantifying that is the is the difficult thing. Yeah, and they don't they don't well they said they don't need to. And this one one the main problem here, but for the commission is there's no there's no guide guidelines, is it? So they just said on a number of things that there was a sporting advantage. They've reached that ten points because there was a sporting advantage. That to be fair to other clubs. You can't have people competing on a level playing field where one club has broken the rules and the other, others haven't and, and have tried to live within the rules. The the other thing they said, which I think is is also I think a concern, is we, we talk about the uh, the football league guidelines and stuff, but you know one five million may be equated to one point. I can't remember the details, but also in the football league the guidelines, and this says that the, the twelve point thing is actually. A bit misleading. You can go higher if there's been aggravating factors. I, you know, the club has made things difficult, and um, it's quite pointedly they say that don't they? In their findings, they say that not only did Everton gain a sporting advantage and have broken broken the rules, they also misled us over the the stadium and such. They won't go into that, but they said that the loans were for the stadium, so therefore they live within PSR, and then they found out they weren't. And I'm sure that's also been baked into the mix. So, in the end, they've got no guidance to work with. But they've said, and up, they've said, because Everton are culpable as well. It's all us. Um, you know, they they quote that twenty one million pounds of your losses of the fact that you did. You said you'd finish sixth, and you finished sixteenth. <laughs> um, they, they they've they've thrown all that culpability on us. They said it's all your fault. It's nothing to do with the stadium. Therefore, you think this is a serious breach. Ten points. And when you read it, when you read all that context and stuff like that, you say, "Well, I can't really argue against that ten points. That ten points may not just is probably not just because we've gone ninety million pound over. It also reflects our behaviour during the commission and the, the information that was provided to the Premier League that was misleading. 
and that's going to be that's going to be in system when it when it comes to appeal. I, I rather sadly read the appeal of Sheffield Wednesday against the Football League, which is in which is in which is which is relevant to this case because this is what will happen. So when it goes goes to appeal, it's in Yeah, it's in They got they got twelve points reduced to six, but that was because of the, yeah. the state technical issue over the stadium. What they said in the appeal, the appeal commission said is they didn't just look at the breach being a sporting advantage. They said you tried to get a sporting advantage because your wage bill was so high and far greater than the guidelines, which she, and that's because you so therefore you breached breached the, the limits. And and an appeal commission may say that Everton, we're not looking at the nineteen point five million. We're looking at the fact that you deliberately tried to get get a sporting advantage by having a wage bill that you couldn't sustain and have players on the pitch that actually you shouldn't have had. And and an appeal commission may look at that as well. I mean, and then that opens up various options over compensation. So it'd be interesting to see how the, the, the appeal commission may look at it in a completely different light, not necessarily in our favour, by the way. I do think you're right there, Gary. Obviously, it's point it tried to labour in the podcast since that for all the talk about stadium loans and 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 transfer levies and that that's really just the yes that's a froth on top that that overspilled. Really, this is an issue over. Yeah, the hundreds of million pounds that was that that was spent under the early years of Mashiri and the fact that it gave Everton a, a foundation that was so close to the limits on this and yeah, the focus is on what may have tipped Everton over the edge, but but really this is an issue over everything else that got them into a position where they were so close to that limit in the first place. But one yeah. thing I, I do have a bit of an issue with, or I do think is a bit of a contradiction within the report, is for all that appear yeah, you know, for all there's this ac- accusation of Everton having misled the um uh, the, the the tribunal, I do find it sits awkwardly that yeah there's there's an aggravation factor the accusation that Everton misled the um the commission but in the same in the same report they also say that they don't think it was a deliberate breach and there's no accusation that Everton acted dishonestly either um, no no and, and, I, I get and, that and it's and I think and I find it strange how you can have all three like really they they probably cancel each other out rather than serve to make the punishment stronger I think. Yeah, I get that, but we, we did, didn't we? we? Ultimately, we told the Premier League it was a loan for the stadium, so within PSR, and then didn't. And that that's, regardless of that, that they, they said that um, that was mis, 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 misled them. Also, as well, it was interesting, in the, and I don't want to go on to this because others was to talk about, there's been a lot of talk about points of sport and advantage. In the Sheffield Wednesday judgment, the appeal said, actually, there's lots of, lots of stuff in football where actually you get penalised. For not getting a sport and advantage, and also we've seen that we've had seen points deductions for nothing to do with sport in the top flight. Man United and also both got points deductions for fighting at Old Trafford. There was that points deduction for Middlesbrough for not turning up for the game. So they're not sport and advantages, but they still got points deduction, and that was one of the other things. That's one of the things that the commission said. So an appeal, uh, sorry, the appeal in the Sheffield Wednesday case said it could be that actually. And the appeal against Everett may say, well, not really interested in the sporting advantage bit because actually we can give you a points deduction or we agree with the points deduction regardless of that. And and that's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. It, just briefly, Huawei, what do you think Evans' approach to the appeal would be? What, what do you think, lads? What, what would you appeal against? Well, they, they can't, given, given the fact they've admitted it, it won't be from a position of innocence. So, yeah. you know, it'll be a case of trying to reduce the sanctions. So I think Largely, it'll be a case of trying to trying trying to get the sanction reduced, probably partly on the basis of the lack of clarity over how they reached it in the first place, that, yeah. and how it compares to, as I say, you know whether they're direct they directly correlate or not, but other instances in which the Premier League has sought to protect its identity, and then I think on that they'll they'll probably build on try and build on some of the mitigating factors I think and and try and yeah. push them again, which. I think we we now seem to be of the knowledge, and there's been a lot of confusion this week. But I think it see it appears to be the accepted wisdom that the commission that overhears the appeal will be the same as the one that um, what do you call it that sat on the case. I think is that is that right? Is that I've seen reports. But that's there. the that's typical oh, compensation. That's compensation. Right, okay. Yeah, that's that. Yeah. That's, that's, it's well, the that's, same well, that's, personnel that's, for the the compensation, but in terms of Everton's appeal. I was told it will be an entirely um, well. That's new that's good. I mean, in which case, obviously, 
trying to strengthen the mitigating factors, you know, there is some kind of degree of sense to that. How much, you know, how much success there'll be, I'm not entirely sure. But I think this will be a case of going to them and say, this won't be a case of going to the commission, uh, the appeal commission and saying, we're, we're innocent. It'll be a case of saying, look, come on, this is this is a bolt from the blue. Where you know, where where have you reached ten points? I mean, the fact that they don't have a a framework for the decision that's been published, I think, will probably aid Everton's cause in that. Um, I mean, one of the things that, for all the talk about the nature of the penalty and how onerous it is for Everton, one thing that's probably also worth considering. I don't think that, I don't think there'd be a change of the nature of the sanction if Everton were successful. I think it'd be a a points a reduction of the points rather than a different type of penalty and the points restored. But say for instance, a lot of the things that we discussed here um over the past week or so. Say for instance the appeal was to come back saying they'll go, Are oh, you successful? We'll give you the ten points back, but we'll give you a transfer ban instead, which I think would probably have a more of a correlation to the nature of the offences. Would you actually see that as a successful given where we are in the season and the weakness of the Premier League and the state of Everton squad and the importance next summer? And I actually say that would make things worse. Yeah, I agree. I'd, I'd take the 10 points now. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. Rather than transfer ban. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we said, we said, I think we said in one of the pods leading up to the, that, we said that, that, that a, a transfer ban would be the worst thing Case for scenario. us because of the bare yeah. nature of the squad. The fact, Joe, you pointed out many times, you've got lots of players who are coming out of contract at the end of end of this summer. Um, that actually, and so, but a threadbare squad will be made even smaller. The worst thing to happen to us will be a transfer ban and a 10 point, 10 point deduction in the season that's probably going to see the lowest points you need to stay up in the Premier League is probably a better, a better result for us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd concur with that completely. Um, Joe and I did a piece this morning along with Paul Wheelock in which we, we gave our thoughts on, on on the issue. And yeah, like like we were saying, as it stands, I mean, last season and the season before, this would have been a death sentence for Everton in terms of Premier League survival that had gone. And possibly but, next season. Yeah. And then, tw- yeah, you're right there, Joe, it could be stronger again next season. Um, but this year, basically, they've got 26 games now to sort of pull back a two-point gap on Luton Town, if you boil it down to to that, basically, because Luton Town are, are safe or above them at the moment. And if they can't sort of overcome a two-point handicap with Luton over 26 games, I know, maddeningly, they couldn't come back from 2-1 down over 45 minutes at Goodison. But if they can't claw back two points on, on Luton Town over 26 games, then they, they, they really are struggling. So, yeah, that would be actually... A much less of an evil for Everton compared to, like you say, a transfer ban at a time when they got the potential for major s- squad overhaul this summer. Um, but I think it, it's like you said before, Joe. It, it, it's the size of this. This is the this is the biggest such punishment in 135 years of the English top flight. More than um, Portsmouth going into administration, having to get you know an exterior people in to stop the club from going into to liquidation in, in, in 2010. So you've actually got a lot of prominent people outside the sport getting involved in this in terms of members of parliament. Ian Byrne from West Derby tabled a motion in parliament. Um, I believe is it 21 MPs have supported this motion now. Um, Alison McGowan raised the issue in, in parliament as well. It, you know, it's not just Everton who were who, who speaking out about this is people beyond the sport and the people in the, the, the wider Merseyside area and even MPs from outside the area. You did a piece on that this week. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to see how it's it's gone beyond the realms of of just football. And, you know, like I said, it's that the, the motion that Ian Byrne tabled um, and then, yeah, it's been backed by, I think, 21 MPs last time I looked. Then you have Bill Esterson, who... Because he's in the shadow cabinet, that's not something that they typically support. But he's written to Richard Masters of the Premier League Chief Executive, and then separately, Alison McGovern, the Wirral South MP, has, has, has been speaking in, in Parliament as well. And you look at the, you know, the mayors, you know, Steve Rotherham, the the mayor of the Liverpool City region, Ooh. has stepped in. And you know, I think that um, there's a lot of positivity, really, that I think Everton can take from this process. The fact that. You know, they perhaps have people, more people willing to fight their cause than I, in, 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 in different arenas that I think we may have thought was going to be the case in this. Um, and I think probably, I'm, 
underpinning all that is a sense from everybody involved in not on the football perspective, but involved in the well-being of Merseyside and, and the Northwest of just how important the stadium project is as a regeneration project for you know, what is an area of, of, of high deprivation and the jobs and the money and the infrastructural developments that that will bring to the stadium. And I think that when you look at the political angle, I think a lot of the interpretation of this is that clearly Everton are in this situation partly because of the intent to build a new stadium. Yet that is something that can have such an overwhelmingly positive effect in an area. You know, it's it's one of probably the most important regeneration projects projects in in, in the country, probably in Northern Europe. Um, mm. And I think that the political angle very much seems to be along those lines of, you know, are Everton being held back slightly by trying to do something which will have a greater good beyond football? Um, and I think there's a degree of relevance to that. Again, you know, not not to labour the point, but to go back to what Gav's saying, look, there has been a little bit of an attempt at financial chicanery and a lot of the evidence problems here are, you know, they're issues that they've created for themselves. Uh, yeah, they, 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 there's no doubt about that. But there is clearly that wider importance of, which we've often spoken about, particularly during the dark days of, of, of last season of how important Everton is to the, the wider Merseyside, you know, the social fabric of the area. And I think the political element has taken that on a little bit more, as well as, and I think this is also important, this obviously is a current that runs through Ian Burns' early day motion, is this belief in the need for an independent regulator. And it's, it's I said this earlier, but it is an irony of this process, how I think that in probably attempting to stave off um, an independent regulator, the way in which this case has unfolded, probably strengthen claims for, for the necessity of, of one regards as to whether or not you think Everton you know, deserve have breached the rules and deserve to be punished. This still probably shows why an independent regulator would be beneficial for everybody. Yeah. And uh, Gav certainly galvanised um, the fan base. Um, there's going to be a um, demonstration at the Premier League headquarters in London today. And then obviously on the, the, the day of the game itself, the, the foot over £40,000 been raised by the 1878s for cards and banners, um, including these cards that they want to hold up at, at various times. They've got up to 40000 of them. So everyone in, in the, the ground could have one of them. And they potentially even... Was in the press box as well. <laughs> How relevant that would be to for us to start raising them. But um, yeah, it's, it's certainly. Uh, it, it, I suppose it, it has brought a, a unifying factor with yeah. the fan base as what what has been a, you know a fractured club at times. Maybe not amongst the fan base, but uh, they. But um, it, it, it's it's certainly um, galvanised them, isn't it, into um, let their feelings be, be known on the issue. Yeah, yeah. Just I'm sorry. To just go back on Joe's point about. The yeah. stadium, I think I agree totally with that. And I was disappointed that in our submission, we didn't make more of that in the mi- yeah. mitigation. The mitigation about the stadium, we said there was some stupid thing about in- incest that they'd already thrown out. What we should have done in the mitigation, we should have said about the socioeconomic benefits of the stadium, that some of our financial planning is being built around that. And okay, we breached, but some of that is because we've had to find cash for the stadium. Yeah, we accept the breach. And, and and gone on about that a lot more than than what we did, and the white benefit by the benefit football venue for the Euro 2028 and all this type of stuff, and you know the the type of thing that fans have picked up upon this week that they criticised mm-hmm. the commission for not make you know that we've been penalised for not building the stadium, but the, we didn't make that point to the commission, and the commission can only go on the evidence that's presented to it, and I'm hoping in the appeal that we'll bring that out a lot more as a mitigation. Yeah. Because I think it is genuinely is a mitigation about how we behave. A, a bit, but not not a total mitigation, but it is a factor that's influenced our financial plan over the last few years, or you know, five or six years. And I was disappointed in that. And I think hopefully the club can make more of that in the appeal, and possibly say the commission never made enough uh, enough of it. Uh, go go back to your point, Chris. Yeah. Going on about socio-economic benefits, one of the benefits of the Commission's decision, there's a lot of princes in Liverpool who've had a lot of money this week, whoever, whoever's printing them cards. And, yeah, I mean, it, it's good to see, and it's bad to see, because it's these type of stuff like protests, and like you saw 12 months ago, are on the back of bad news, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so we, we need to take that into account. But it, it's good, and it's good to see people rallying. I don't necessarily think that some of the stuff that people are saying is on, 
you know, on, you know, is, is right, is truthful, uh, but, you know, based on facts. But the general spirit of it, yeah, yeah, you can see why fans have reacted like that. And you know, as, as many people have said, it's taken this to get the, the board and the the fans, you know, as well, which is we've not seen for for, for many many years. And it's just be interesting to see how that plays. I was we're contractually obliged to say here that you know that everybody should behave themselves, and our our reputation, you yeah. know, could be damaged by if, if you know by misbehaviour. Yeah. Um, and I think um, that that's also important to say. But yeah, and then just and then again, this goes back to one of the mitigation factors, isn't it, about the socio-economic benefits of the stadium? Is fans care? Yeah. You know, it, 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 we live. It's it, you know. Liverpool, as you know, has had the problems over the years, and the stadium is a a a something that gives fans hope. And this, these types of process sort of back that up, don't they? That fans care so much that they're they raising money and the, the, the you know the prepared to process and, and stuff like that. And it sort of supports this economic and social mitigation of, of the stadium. And yeah, I, I was disappointed the club didn't make more of that. They should have done. And um, but it, it's also it's always you always get a warm warm glow when you see fans pulling together, don't you? Whatever, whether whether you think it's based on the full facts or not. Well, Joe, um, obviously it's going to be there's going to be the plane over obviously Manchester City Liverpool the, the day before because um, as, we, as it's been pointed out, it'd be dark at Goodison. But in terms of uh, what we're most bothered about, you know, the, the Everton Manchester United game, this this atmosphere marks be, um, before kick off. So I suppose, although again, it's on the back of something negative, I suppose after all those protest marches we saw early in the year, at least they'd be trying to sort of rally everyone together so you can get a, a positive from a negative situation. I I cannot wait till Sunday. Like I am really, really kind of ex- yeah. I think excited is the right word. Because I think that I think that Goodison and and we you know we have seen Goodison in all its powerful glory at different points over the past 18 months, often for the wrong reasons, you know, uniting in, in, in relegation battles and then also in, in, in protests. But I just can't think of a, of a of a better arena and a better fan base for a protest like this. And I think that it's going to be so, so, so intense on, on Sunday. And I just, I get this every now and then, you know, when I have important days at work and, you know, the last time I felt this was, was probably the Bournemouth game, last game of the season, when obviously you know what time kickoff is. You know, there's only so much that you can do in advance and, and things like that. But just going through my mind at the minute, it's like I just don't think I can get to the ground early enough because you just want yes. you're going to miss something. I just see no matter if I get there, obviously it's half four kickoff. You know, normally I'd get there probably about two, half past two. If I get there at one o'clock, I won't think I've got there early enough. If I get there at eight o'clock in the morning, I won't think I've got there early enough. I'm so interested to see how it how it plays out. I remember for the Bournemouth game, just being so nervous and just getting there, and rather than do what we normally do, go into the media suite and you know get yourself set up, and and you know we're very fortunate because we get a free dinner and things like that. I brought back lunch from Greg's, and I just skipped the media suite. And last game of the season, I just went and stood in me. Went and sat in my press seat in an empty Goodison and just sat there and just like full of nervous anticipation over kind of what was going to happen. Obviously, that was kind of what I needed to do to prepare myself, get myself in like in the mindset for working on that day. Um, and whilst it's the right thing to do, it's so interesting. I then also remember seeing all the pictures from County Road as the fans kind of yeah. waited and built. You know, the, the roads all got closed off to greet the team and thinking, ah, oh, I'm missing that. You, I go sitting in the stands, you could hear them outside. And I know it's going to be the case on on Sunday. I won't be able to get there early enough. Wherever I'll be, I'll be thinking I should be somewhere else. You know, if I'm if I'm in my press seat early watching the players come into the ground, or you know, watching some of the cards being put out, then I'll think oh, I should be in the Winslow, getting the atmosphere there, or I should be in the press room, or I should be on County Road watching things. Like I really do think this is going to be, you know, albeit for um, you know, for in reasons of adversity and ones that we don't really w- want to be. Having at Everton, I, I do think this will be a, a bit of a monumental occasion. Um, I think the opposition helps being a Manchester United. It gives a sense of real it game, a real sense of occasion as well. You know, it's a, it's a true, proper, prestigious Premier League fixture. In fact, it's going to be under the lights at Goodison in the dark on Sky. Yeah, there is just no better setting for you know the protest and the reaction that we're gonna that we're gonna see. And I think when that siren goes off or when Zed Cars plays, I think it's gonna be absolutely phenomenal inside that stadium. And um 
you know, hopefully it'll be a driving force because obviously if, you know, for all that we say about, or for all that I'm looking at Sunday and thinking that Man United are a good opposition on the pitch as well because, you know, they are so fragile at the moment. They are a club that's probably in more of a crisis than Everton. Um, uh, such as the way that Sean Dyche has kind of got things improved on the pitch. They still have a lot of talent and I have a little bit of nerves about what happened if, say, for instance, you know, you know, I got an early goal and just deflated the atmosphere, but hopefully that won't happen. Like, I, I think Goodison is going to be just so intense on Sunday and I'm absolutely there for it. You know, I, I kind of, you know, I, I like what Gavs kind of says there, you know, one thing that football can do is it can bring people together and I think the way in which the Everton fan base is has responded to this, you know, albeit there has to be an acceptance that Everton have, 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 you know, have, have done wrong and, and deserve to be a punishment. I do think that the extent and the severity of the club's treatment in this has just acted as a catalyst to, to just fuel a lot of positive, proactive action from the club and, you know, and, and, and the supporters. And I think we'll see that once again. And we've been albeit in difficult circumstances, we've been fortunate enough to see how powerful that can be several times over the past 18 months, two years. And I'm looking forward to seeing it from a basis where everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet, club players, fans, which I think will be the case on Sunday. Yeah. Joe talks about sat there in the press box on his own, eating his butties. It was me who was out on County Road with Andy T. Vader, the, the echo photographer. It was me doing all those marches. So he probably sent me out there again. I'm, I'm like his danger man. Um, out on the streets with, with, with the people. Yeah. Um, Gav, yeah, there's a small matter to finish this podcast of, of a fixture against Manchester United. We've spoken for like 40 minutes here. I've not really talked about a ball being kicked. Yeah, it's still a game to be played Sunday, isn't there? Very much. Um, there's always going to be of huge importance now, far more important. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just about, I, I think it'll be, I think you'll see something on Sunday that we've not seen before. I think it'll be way in excess of Bournemouth game and the end of the 21 22 season, certainly be, beforehand and, and the mood. I, I think it'll be far greater. But as you say, this I mean, yeah, and United got this this thing at the top of the form table and stuff, but they've beaten a few clubs, you know, the far smaller than with all due respect by, by last minute goals. They are fragile. Um we've had an international break where we probably had not as many players away. I know they were saying last week that they had the players give them a break. Um I think we'll be far fresher than United. Um the thing is though, is and this is always the 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 thing on this occasion, don't get distracted by the atmosphere. You've got a game of football to be played and sometimes you can overeat, can't you? And you've got to keep cool heads. And and I think Gary Neville made the point, didn't he, on at the, that podcast that after, after 20 minutes, it's just another game of football. And I think that's right. But I, but I do think our form over the last six weeks, two months, gives us a very good chance of beating United. To be honest with you, assuming everybody's fit and firing, I think that I think we, we can, you know, we can easily get a, a good result on on Sunday, irrespective of the the atmosphere before and during the game. Right. Well, we'll wrap things up. Then we'll, we'll come to predictions time. Then I'll, I'll I'll set us off. I think I I think that you no know, Everton will be at capacity. They're going to be great, and I th- I think that. Um, you know, for United, though, for all their troubles, they are still Manchester United and uh, they've got a lot of quality players in there. So I'll start us off and I'll, and I'll say 1-1. One, one. about you, Joe? How do you see it going? Yeah, I'm going, I'm going hopeful. I'm going 1-0 to Everton. James yeah. Garner, United product, Greg Academy product, mm. set piece. James Tarkovsky, childhood Man United fan header. Goodison, yeah. Goodison lift off like the Corey against Bournemouth. Um, and then just sixty minutes of, of battling against um, battling against battling against the momentum of Manchester United to the you know, the chorus of the crowd singing out against the Premier League. So that's what I'm going yeah. for. Hope you're right there, Gav. You say there's plenty plenty of potential for the home win. Then, so what what do you reckon? Yeah, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go with the default dice one nil. Uh, <laughs> yeah. My prediction that Joe will get a steak, bacon, a sausage roll before uh, <laughs> the game. Which, if you if you want to do you want a quick aside about last Friday, which was a terrible day, obviously because of the ten point ban, I was going out for a drink after work, so I got I got a steak bacon and a, and a sausage roll from Greg's, and guess what? A seagull nicked me steak bacon, exchange flags, and that wow. sort of summed up the uh, summed up my day. What a day! Yeah, you taken uh, from you, and you know, it's as cruel manner as the ten points would have done. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm appealing. I'm appealing against me losing my steak bacon. 
I see if I see if they get anywhere. Um, for a, a, a better run, Brighton coming in and stealing Everton's place in the top eight, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. No, one nil Everton. I think the the, the, the classic dice score line. I think we'll all enjoy that. Well, let's hope you're right then, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for, for coming and joining us on this, and obviously there'll be plenty of discussion in the aftermath of this. I've been yours, Chris Beasley. Been joined by Joe Thomas, Gavin Buckland. This has been the Royal Blue Podcast. Uh-huh.